Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Hello, team. Welcome to Scream Something, Volume 12. My name is Emily, and I'm here with my co-host, Producer Neil. Hey, everybody. In Scream Something, Emily and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions for the episodes that were released over the last two Thursdays. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes, but our team will be saving our deeper analysis for the full episode breakdowns we have planned for after the season finale. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The titles for this week's episodes are Tale of Two Sisters and Artemis Through the Looking Glass. The release dates were November 4th and 11th of 2021. The in-episode dates were March 26th and April 17th through 20th. And the directors were Vinton Huck and Christina Soda. And the writers were Brian Holfeld and Brandon Vietti. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode starts in Star City, where we get a glimpse into an ordinary day in Artemis Croc's wonderful life, only for it all to come crashing down at the news of Connor's death. We then cut to nearly a month later, where everything in Artemis's life is still very off kilter. We get a flashback to a much younger Artemis training with Sportsmaster and sparring with her sister, and in the present, Artemis decides that it's time to track down Jade. What appears to be an ambush on Artemis at the university library a little later is thwarted by Arrowette and Arsenal, but her would-be attacker turns out to be a girl named Onyx, claiming that she's defected from the League of Shadows, is seeking asylum, and wants to warn Artemis that Cassandra Savage will be attempting to do exactly the same thing so that she can infiltrate their team as a mole for the Shadows. This plot. (laughs) (laughs) And, of course, at that exact moment, Cassandra shows up claiming that she's actually defecting for real and that Onyx is the one who's lying. And with no way to tell who's actually telling the truth, the team takes both of them into custody. (laughs) Meanwhile, Cheshire arrives on Infinity Island and attacks Sensei, saying that she knows there's been a contract out on her for years and she's here to end the conflict by killing Sensei. However, Talia Al Ghul steps in and an argument about motherhood ensues only to be broken up by Cheshire's phone going off and her running out in response. We get another flashback, this time to the night Cheshire ran away from home, which we saw back in season one. And in the present, our heroes are attacked by shadows seemingly attempting to reclaim Cassandra and or Onyx. Which my favorite scene of the series so far, but we'll, and after everyone works together to take down the bad guys, the team secures the two possible defectors at Green Arrow's vault. Even after questioning both of them and conferring amongst themselves, nobody has any idea who is telling the truth. Could be one, the other, both, or neither. Like, yep, yep, very complicated. Moving on, we get a couple of more flashbacks to Artemis and Jade on the night that Cheshire ran away from home. But in the present, Jade arrives at the Harper Nguyen Croc home. That was a lot, and I did better than I thought I would. Home in Star City at 4 a.m., demanding to know why Paula called her and why she's awake. No, not really. I added that myself, only for Artemis to enter and reveal that she's the one who made the call. Cut to tear-jerking credit scenes, because that's all of them. (laughs) Apparently. After we're all done crying from the credit scene last week, episode six opens with yet another flashback to baby Artemis, this time with a black eye and a broken arm, as Cheshire crawls in through the window sometime after she ran away. But before we can get more information on that, we cut back to the present where the two sisters are arguing about why Artemis called Jade, and Artemis explains the situation with Onyx and Cassandra and asks for Jade's help determining who's lying. She reluctantly agrees to assist, and we then cut over to the premiere building in Hollywood, where Beast Boy tells Wonder Girl that he's apparently too tired from his big trip back to Mars to help with the outsiders right now. But there's more problems. Yeah. (laughs) To say the least, there are more problems than just being tired. The interrogation of Onyx and Cassandra continues without results, and we get the rest of that flashback from the very beginning, with Sportsmaster kicking Cheshire out again when he catches her asking Artemis for help, because she's got to do this all on her own, apparently. 
back in the present, a moment between Artemis and her new boyfriend, Jason Bard, is interrupted by Cheshire, and the Croc sisters have a conversation. Jade's sources don't have any more intel on who's telling the truth, so Cheshire agrees to interrogate both of the uh, defectors that they have in custody. We get yet another flashback, because that's just going to be what these episodes are for a minute. Yeah. This time, showing little Artemis meeting up with younger Jade on a rooftop to give her some food, and Jade promising to come back tomorrow night to pay her back. This will go well, I'm sure. <laughs> and in the present, Artemis lets Cheshire into the vault and convinces Orphan not to kill her. <laughs> not today. Not today, Orphan. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the Premier Building, a still-depressed Beast Boy watches a news broadcast that reveals King Brion has opened Markovia to all metahumans and caused a refugee crisis as frightened non-metahumans flee into Vladiva. Back at the vault, Cheshire interrogates both Onyx and Cassandra, and we learn a little more about each of them, or at least about the stories they're telling. However, the conversation between Cheshire, Artemis, and Orphan about who to trust is interrupted by Black Spider and Rictus breaking into the vault. A giant fight ensues, and Lady Shiva arrives with Shade, kidnaps Orphan, and tells Artemis that to get Orphan back alive, she'll have to bring Cassandra Savage to Santa Prisca in the next 24 hours. Artemis and the others start planning what to do next, but Cheshire refuses to be a part of it and leaves. Near the end of the episode, we get one more flashback because we, of course we did, um, this time to little Artemis waiting on the rooftop for Jade to arrive, but she never shows. And instead, S Lawrence Crusher Croc, aka Sportsmaster, finds Artemis and drags her back to training. Finally, we close out the episode in the present where Halo arrives at the vault for guard duty only to find out it, only to find it wrecked from the fight and empty. Hard cut to nine hours later where Artemis, Onyx, and Cassandra Savage are flying over the Caribbean Sea in the super cycle. Sad again. Well, we'll get into the sad again and everything else in Feeling the Aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. There is a lot to have Aster about, and so we will kick it off. Yes. Emily, what is your first? What is your first thing? As my notes are always in chronological order, seemingly, my first thing is that I, I love the little opening of episode five. It is a very cute little look into how Artemis is doing okay, and I love that for her, even though it is immediately followed up by everything being a disaster again. But it's nice to know that at least for a little bit, apparently Artemis has been doing okay. But I also really, with that opening, love the simplicity of the storytelling and having her just walk in and see Nightwing and Aquaman standing there and immediately knowing that somebody has to be dead, which is a little bit heartbreaking to think that apparently this is procedure enough for her to just know, but also it works perfectly in that moment. Like, yeah, of course, of course, that's how that goes. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't sure that our first Aster would, would be such a bummer, but my thought is that she can reference the time. Cause if you think of the hall, like the hall of heroes where we have the, the holograms that both, I mean, Calder lost Tula, Dick lost jason and so like she's seeing what that loss is and can recognize on the faces but yeah the idea that she would very very quickly know that that's why they're there is yeah it's a lot it's a lot but it's it's good it's a lot but it's done well so i have another couple more sad ones before i get okay. to like some because these episodes have a lot of fun but like the beginning of these ones are sad and i want to recognize that the sadness is done very well Little thing, but calling out, I love getting to see the scene with the photo mm -hmm. that's ta that was taken right before uh, Red Arrow joined the League. And it's just nice seeing that scene in context after those trailers and <laughs> everyone being like, when was this photo taken? And people piecing it together and just getting to see that whole thing and just everything about that was good. And just overall, everything about Artemis mourning and dealing with her grief near the beginning of this episode is so honest and raw and a lot more painful than we expect from most superhero cartoons, yeah. but is to be expected at this point with Young Justice. 
And just props to Brian Holfeld and Stephanie Lemlin for pulling that off and making it work so well in this episode. Because just when you think you've stopped crying from last week, it's like, hey, want to watch Artemis be sad for 10 minutes? And you're like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And as much as, because she certainly has to deal with those those feelings on her own. And I know that, like, I, I feel like I took away, and this may just be certainly headcanon, but I feel like I took away the vibe that she also, like, really wanted, wants to be there for McGann, who's, you know, on Mars and T minus two months away via baby. But, um, well, I mean, we did jump a month ahead, so. We jumped almost a month because I was paying attention yeah. to the timestamps on my rewatch because I'm like, because we have to write out the timestamps, but also because I'm like, how long has it been? When's Miss Martian going to show up? Is she going to I have questions. <laughs> What's the timeline here? Uh, and of course, it's so subtle, but so easy to convey like the glass dropped versus caught. Like that's it's so yeah. little, but it's it says so, so much at the same time. She's just. She's just not on the ball and she's just thinking she's in her own head and she's dealing with a lot. Everybody go hug mm-hmm. Artemis. Uh, everybody go hug. It. Literally, these couple of episodes were a lot of me staring at the TV going, oh, my God, can we get everybody therapy? Uh, but I can also trust this show that, like, there is a, a relatively high chance that, yes, we will get everybody some fa- mm-hmm. therapy and some catharsis and figure it out. Last sad thing for a bit, uh, since we're still on Artemis, I noticed on my rewatch that I think that the music that plays in Artemis's car while she's driving to the university library is the same music from the Superboy fan memorial that we see in the next episode. And that hurt me. It might not be the same. I might be making a leap here, but it sounds like the same sad acoustic guitar. Yeah, it's it's pretty close to what it, what I had written down was like it 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 worked really well. Like the like let's start there. Dy- dynamic music partners are, I mean they have they have countless awards that tell the exact sentence I will say is they're very very good at what they do. <laughs> <laughs> These award winning composers yes like are good at music. <laughs> Who would have guessed? We need to buy another trophy case. Yeah, um, but the but the idea that like I don't remember like a, a sad acoustic track before now. Also, yeah. what I noted is that it seemed like she was intentionally playing it. Just the vibe that I can't tell if it was intentional choice of the scene, but did she get out and it stopped? Like that's what happens in my yeah. in my car. Is like as soon as I'm done, if I turn the car off, it'll still play. But as soon as I open the door, the music stops. I'm like. Was she intentionally playing sad music as she drove? Because then when we see it later, it's being played intentionally then again. Um, And it is very, very similar, if not the same track. It is. To use some fancy film class words, it's diegetic sound. It is sound that is actually being played in the scene, not non-diegetic sound, like a soundtrack. So fun, fun fact for the day. You've all learned my favorite film class words. Yes. Um, so to dive in to some less sad, more fun things. This is the quickest shot in this episode, but Arouette has an arrow selection screen on her mm. heads up display. Mm. And it's the coolest concept to me in all of this. Just the idea of once they introduced these like heads up display contacts, oh, I love so how they've been building them out and using them for different things. And I love the idea that Arouette's like, cause they've shown us this season, like everybody who has a, who uses a bow and arrow has like an enclosed quiver. Like there aren't arrows sticking out of it this season. So the idea that they just have like a programmed heads up display way of being Mm -hmm. able to select arrows with like eye movement to get exactly the one they want is very cool. Yeah. Superhero nonsense. I love it. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting because as much work as I've done with students with disabilities, the ability for, um, the motion tracking through the eye to be a way for, you know, someone, let's say they were completely physically disabled, but they had the movement of their eyes, how much they could still interact with the world via a computer is really, really impressive. And anything that they do with this is just like right up my alley. Because like you said, it's, it's rife for Easter eggs, which obviously that's kind of our deal. Um, But also the idea that 
it almost makes me think of, you know, because of, again, the world that we, the fandoms that we revolve in, it makes me think of like custom OBS screens for like streams because like they're different for each person. They're different for each team that goes out because like, like, you know, here is Arsenal's logo, just a fist, but the idea that it's like, it's only showing who you're connected to as a team. It's giving you your customized options for you as a person. And that means like on the back end, Oracle's like specifically building all of this for them. Or like, do you have your own login and like you can customize like, it? Just a wonderful rabbit hole of just the, it's s- the so system. Cool. And instantly I am always afraid of like one hack away from like ruining everyone's life. Shh. Yeah. It's okay. Shh, Neil, no. My bad. <laughs> no, let me just be excited about the cool thing. Agreed, agreed. It, no, no inevitable I, consequences. No, I loved it. I loved every minute. And like I, I paused it. I mean, those are probably my most paused moments. It's just like, okay, what's every single thing that I can see here? Oh, I wonder what kind of arrow that actually is. Um, yep. First time through that, that one shot is on screen for like three seconds. And my brain went, gonna have to pause that later. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just file that. I was like, not right now. There are things going on, but later. <laughs> So speaking of just cool stuff and fight scenes for a minute, uh, Red Arrow stabs someone in the back with a pen Mm -hmm. deep enough to draw blood. And that's one of the more hardcore things I feel like we've seen on this show in a bit. And that's saying something over these past two seasons. Like, I don't know why. Actually, I do know why, but like somebody getting stabbed in the back with a pen felt a lot more visceral than someone falling into a lava pit. (laughs) Mm, Yeah. Uh, It makes me think of like that born identity scene. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yeah. The the other one that I thought of and like, I'm, you know, this is why like I don't belong in the writer's room ever for Young Justice, Um, because if you look at my notes, the line that he clearly should have said is that the pen is mightier than the sword. But he's got to promote Agreed. Go Hunter security. We got to promote the brand. <laughs> he has free merch to give. The other option clearly could have been Bow Hunter security, always on point, as <laughs> after stabbing him with a pin. I'm just saying. We can only use the catchphrase so many times. Okay. Neil. Okay. Fine. Fine. But yes, <laughs> no, I also you're love valid. That, like, you're valid and you're right, and you should say it. You've um, mother of goat. Um, that was, that's a thing that happened. It, you broke my clipboard, mother of goat, and then used the pin. It was, like I said, this is probably my favorite scene out of all four seasons. I'm so glad. <laughs> so speaking of Red Arrow, I, shifting gears slightly, I would like to just remind everyone of, I would like to bring back the eternal refrain of go read the Red Arrow journals because these two episodes reference a couple of things from the Red Arrow journals, which for anybody who doesn't know, were a collectible in the Young Justice Legacy video game that were basically diary entries from over the course of the five-year time skip that you could collect and together they form a kind of bare bones timeline of Red Arrow uh, teaming up with Cheshire, joining the League of Shadows, them getting together, them getting married, Cheshire leaving, uh, them leaving the League of Shadows, Cheshire and him getting married, her leaving, him falling down the spiral that is season one to season two Red Arrow, et cetera, et cetera. They have been typed up and reshared online. If you go Google it, you can find them. I highly recommend reading them. If you watched these episodes and heard Cheshire say, I know there's been a contract on my head ever since I uh, betrayed the League to save Red Arrow. And we're like, what? When did that happen? Ta-da. Red Arrow journals. I hope we'll get to see and hear more about that because I am one of those people who anytime stuff from the Red Arrow journals comes up, I'm just like... So, how much money do I need to give DC to get an hour hour long special that is just the entirety of the Red Arrow journals? Yes. Please and thank you. Slides a ten dollar bill across the table to DC Comics. <laughs> that was it. That was the number they were looking for. That was the whole that was it. That's all they needed from me. <laughs> Clearly. But uh and speaking of Cheshire, who features heavily in the Red Arrow journals. 
as anyone would mm-hmm. assume. Mm-hmm. I one of my fa- I love getting to see Cheshire again in these episodes because she is amazing and I love her. She is chaos and a disaster, and I love getting to see her be funny on my screen again after we got so little of her last season. So I loved seeing her again. Uh, but one of my favorite little moments with Cheshire in these episodes that um is the flashback we get to the night Jade ran away that's her sitting on the bus. Because I think for me and probably for a lot of other viewers, specifically women watching, it's a very humanizing moment for this character that has been built up as like ultimate international assassin. She's so good and so competent and all of these things. Because in this scene, Jade is a 13 year old girl alone at night on public transportation have it, I remember talking to some people and we're talking about like someone brought up the fact that like, oh, I didn't realize that guy was supposed to be mm-hmm. threatening or shady looking until uh, like reading the subtitles or something like that. And every woman in this conversation was like, no, I fully understood what was going on in that scene, because when you are a 13 year old girl alone at night on public transportation, any man standing next to your seat even if he has the best intentions in the world, is going to feel like a threat. And so that scene makes Cheshire feel so much more human for a second, because even though she's able to scare this guy off by just showing that she has a weapon on her, the look of like her looking out the window is so much more vulnerable than I think we have ever seen Cheshire in this show in a while. Like we've seen her vulnerable a couple of times, but this is one of those moments where I'm like, Cheshire is scared in that moment. And it is a very good character building moment. And I like it in just that it's it is very simple and it does not need to do much to tell us something. Because the scene of like we've had that scene of Cheshire running away from home since season one and that scene watching it in season one and viewing it like from Artemis's perspective, you're like, oh, Cheshire is such a put together, mature teenager that she thinks she can take on the world and she's so tough and she's just going to leave and abandon her baby sister. And then seeing that exact same character a couple hours later, or even just right after leaving home, having that moment of being scared and alone out in the world and having to be very Cheshire about it, of how she gets out of that situation, but still having it be a really good moment of like emotional context for that character and where she's at and i just think it was great and i just want to call that out there's i'm when we dive deep into these episodes i'm gonna have so much to say about little baby artemis and younger cheshire Mm -hmm. so i'm trying to limit myself right now (laughs) i'm failing delete that delete that yeah i I do that often with the scream something once okay i'm ready i'm ready for what's about to happen next okay Because Neil can see my notes uh, that none of you at home can see. So I am going to put on my English major hat for a second, pull out my shiny English degree and uh, for two minutes. And I'm going to explain to you all the ending of A Tale of Two Cities so you can understand why I'm in so much pain. Uh, So spoilers for a 162 year old novel in case you care. Oh, no. (laughs) someone was going to read that tomorrow. Ah. Okay. So the quote over the credits of episode five, a lot of viewers probably since this is a DC show, uh, know that that quote, it gets featured in a dark Knight rises uh, at the very end of dark Knight rises, but it's from the very, very end of a tale of two cities. And which is the book that we see multiple times throughout this episode. And it's from the title of the episode, all of that. This episode's got a lot to do with tale of two cities. So basically, a very, very condensed crash course of the relevant plot details here is in Tale of Two Cities, there is a man named Sidney Carton who has been in love with this girl named Lucy for a good stretch of this book. Uh, (laughs) But he is a disaster and he believes that she can't love him back. So instead of really pursuing that, he just dedicates himself to making sure she's happy for the rest of her life. And Lucy falls in love with this man named Charles Darnay and everything seems all right. They get married. They have some kids. They have one kid. Um, 
But then the, the French Revolution happens, and for reasons too complicated to explain, Lucy's husband, Charles Darnay, gets arrested and sentenced to death. And after several failed attempts to get Charles Darnay released, Sidney Carton eventually just switches places with Lucy's husband on the day of his execution so that uh, Charles Darnay can escape and live out the rest of his life with Lucy. And Sidney goes to the guillotine in his place, ultimately sacrificing everything for the chance that Lucy might be happy. And these final lines are him thinking about the future that will be ensured by him sacrificing his life in Charles Darnay's place. They cut out some of them for the credits in Young Justice, uh, because I went and reread the quote when making sure I had all the relevant plot details in place here. Uh, And they cut out the ones that are very, like, specific to characters in Tale of Two Cities, because listing random character yeah. names that you have no context for is not going to be as emotionally effective as picking the ones with the with the vibe we're going for here. So I all of that is the context for this quote that breaks me, especially because do not even talk to me about the quote, I see her, an old woman weeping for me on the anniversary of this day, connected to Connor because ow, I'm not okay. Thank you. English major hat is being taken off for now. Well, yay! <laughs> no, now I don't. Now I don't get to read it. The novel was spoiled. Yeah, because I need you to understand. I so I read this book nearly a decade ago. Now I think is how time works. Mm. Um, and I remembered most of these details off the top of my head. And when looking it up to make sure I had most of it correct, I came across like the full plot summary and was like, gosh, there's a lot more plot in this book that I didn't remember. I remember the part that's relevant for the emotional catharsis of the very end and don't remember 70% of the rest of the plot. It's a big book. There's a lot going on. Feel free to read it if you really want, but there's a lot happening. Mm -mm. So Mm -mm. speaking of books... I have joked repeatedly after these two episodes that these three episodes, these two episodes confirmed that there are at least three other books in the Young Justice universe besides the Mysteries of Adolfo. But, oh, yeah. as longtime listeners will know, we have joked that there is one book in Young <laughs> Justice. But I need you to know, just when we thought we'd escaped rewatching these episodes in the very beginning of episode six, so when they show Artemis's room. Uh, and there's a stack of books on her uh, nightstand. And there's a shot where those are in the foreground as Cheshire is coming in through the window. I paused it. And the only title you can make out on one of the books is The Mysteries of Adolfo. <laughs> huh. So just when we think we've expanded the Young Justice Library, this book has come back to haunt us and we will never be free. My brain. My brain has gone so many places. Um, okay. <laughs> So yes, there, what would you like to say? Neil? We, we have an ever increasing number of books, but it was really that I, that your next one had my mind reeling of how you would even accomplish it. I kind of wish we had the timestamp information on all of the flashbacks with Jade and Artemis, because we can assume a general timeline based on like, oh, there's all the same designs as that first flashback. And we know when that first flashback was kind Mm -hmm. of basically, but I'm here like, how long did it take for Jade to come back is my first question seeing those scenes. And we don't know. And I get that there's no easy way to do that since the show has shied away from putting an actual numbered year on anything ever. Yeah. Like we only have relative time and I get that and I get why that works. But at the same time, I'm also over here like, okay, but, but, but how long did it take Jade to come back? Yeah. How long did it take Jade to run into some problems? I want to know. Cause there's a difference between whether it was a week or several months or whatever it might've been. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to some degree, like Artemis is, Injury could help contextualize some of it. And at the same time, like, what would you possibly do? Say, like, team year, negative five. Like, what's <laughs> right. the T-Y? Or what do we just say, T-Y? Is that like our, a- like our BCAD? Do we just use T-Y? Um, 
uh, as like the reference point. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I told one, I wholeheartedly agree. Two, uh, I have no idea how you would accomplish such a task without, I mean, I guess short of using TY, plus or minus. Yeah. <laughs> Just the chaos of like, I get it, but also I want to know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of this flashback, the first time I watched this episode, I remember sitting there and Cheshire has the thing where she says, like, we're all mad here, mad as hatters, and then she leaves. And I remember sitting there and just being like, well, that was a really awkward way to work in your aesthetic wonderland angle, but okay, whatever. Only for it to then be followed up by the kind of acknowledgement of like, yes, it is kind of weird and forced because it's Jade frantically trying mm -hmm. to figure out a way to fit in this phrase so that Artemis knows where to meet her and this whole thing. And I'm like, why did I ever doubt if I think what it's like, whenever I think something sounds kind of weird on young justice, there's like a 90% chance they're going to go. Yes. It sounds weird on purpose. Uh, and it works good. Yeah. Uh, well, the whole relationship and like that short, having that short flashback and then showing that shorthand showing, you know, you knew that there is basically shared trauma from, you know, being sports masters children, but then being able to see that and then also seeing how they adapted to it and the relationship they have all good. Very good. Yeah. Especially because I think I, for the longest time, and I think a lot of people probably for the longest time, assumed that like after Cheshire ran away, her and Artemis didn't see each other until she joined the team and Cheshire was out there being an assassin and they ran into each other because she seemed so shocked the first time oh, they yeah. meet up. But this gives some context of like, not quite. Not quite that. Uh, and I am interested to see how the rest of this arc unfolds and what other other light we get shed on their past and their relationship. Because I've said it before, if these four episodes or however many episodes it's going to be with this arc were just flashbacks of baby Artemis and little Cheshire, I would be here for it. Uh, the convoluted espionage plot is just icing on the cake Whoa. for me. <laughs> so I before we get into that, espionage plot because we'll get there i'm sure i'm sure we have thoughts on it i just really love jade apparently i wanted to throw out that uh friend of the show and resident harper when croc family expert ariel horn uh reminded me when i asked that in the flashback of jade running away from home uh she's supposed to be 13 and artemis is supposed to be nine uh which i always forget i in several conversations kept referring to cheshire as being 15 and i'm like nope Nope, she's younger than that. Uh, and it's just, gosh, these kids, someone protect them. They're so small, and I just want them to be safe. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to throw that out because I wanted to remind other people and remind myself because I keep forgetting that that's what age yeah. they're supposed to be in their flashbacks. But also, general things, with that in mind, I think it's very funny. I did another slight English major deep dive into the book that Cheshire gives to Artemis, uh, dumb luck. And I'm sure by the time we get into deep dives, I will have done some more research because I've only, I have not had enough time to sit with this and figure out what it, what it all means. Uh, but it's a piece of Vietnamese political satire or like cultural satire from 1936 that was apparently banned in Vietnam from 1960 to 1986 for being, shall we say, not very kid-friendly, uh, <laughs> since we are a, a PG-rated podcast. And all of that makes it even funnier to me that little baby Cheshire got this for even younger Artemis and yeah. was like, here, <laughs> Take this. It's it has a youth fiction sticker on it from the Gotham Public Library, but I'm just like, um, um, is it? Google says that it's not. Uh, <laughs> but I just wanted to share that because I've been thinking too much about all of the books in these episodes. But overall, I just I love seeing Jade and Artemis together in these episodes. I love their conversation in the park. I love that Cheshire is here to just poke at every single one of Artemis's buttons and it's fun and they're chaos, but they also clearly understand each other and care about each other. And the fact that they do 
love each other has always been one of my favorite things about the way their relationship has been presented of like they're both very different very very opposite sides of everything people but they're also like yeah but you're still my sister and i still want you to be okay yeah it's good anything you want to share before i go on to some more things about the near the end of the episode here no i i mean that Everything that is this relationship between the two of them is is written so well, acted so well that I was just, I was just happy that we're here, just happy that we're get to see it. And will she ever see her own her kid again? I don't know, but at least she's having a good time with her sister. So. I have high hopes. I very much feel like from these episodes that Artemis is clearly just trying to slowly trick Jade into picking her own redemption arc, yep. and I love it. She's like, I can't save you, but I'm going to keep bringing up that you could save yourself if you wanted to. Doors always open. Maybe it would be safer if we were both in the house. Yeah, I'm just going to just list, just casually slip into conversation every reason that maybe you should come home and figure out your life. But speaking of this, one of my, in the, there's a lot of great stuff in the um, interrogation with uh, Cheshire and Cassandra and Onyx. And it's all great. And I'm sure once we start really breaking down this espionage plot, once we have more context in later episodes, I will be thinking even more about all of it. But right now, one of my favorite lines from it is Jade saying, how did you find how did you find Tigris? Why did you choose this? one?" And Onyx replying, are you kidding? She still goes by Artemis Croc. It took me three minutes on the Internet Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's perfect. (laughs) Yeah, because I feel like everybody's been thinking that for a couple seasons now, and uh, it's very funny to see it mentioned <laughs> that it's just part of like the whole thing we saw last season of the light cross the board agreeing of like there are some lines we will not cross. <laughs> yes, which that I mean, you brought it up. Okay, that that line was the line where she's like, "You broke the rules. You followed me from my house." Yeah. I was I was thinking I might put this in crashing the mode, but yes, yeah. I hear you. Where it's just like, yeah, uh, everyone agrees that we all know where everyone is, but you don't go to someone's house, okay? You just don't do it. You see him out on the streets, that's totally fine. You don't <laughs> go to the That's different. That's very different. You do not go to the street where they live. So my last two things are going to be kind of sad. So hopefully Neil maybe has something else to follow up my sad things so that we don't end on sad things. Yes. So quick crash course into the details of Beast Boy's room because I paused it and stared at the screen for so long and I want to call them all out because gosh, I love attention to detail in people's bedrooms in (laughs) fiction like this. We've got a hat and a Batman shirt that he wore in season three and that we saw. We have everybody's favorite fast food brand, Chicken Whizzies, uh, on like the table. Mm-hmm. There's some wrappers. Uh, there's a tablet with the Outsiders logo, which we have established over the season. They have their own logo, and it's a cool little thing. There's a gaming console that is definitely not a Nintendo Switch. <laughs> Don't ask too many questions. There's a Hello Megan poster, a Space Trek 3016 poster, and the photos over his desk are, if I am not mistaken, the selfie of him as a gorilla after saving i think her name was angel o'day last Mm -hmm. season we found out (laughs) the magic of the credits everybody is somebody there is a shot of him and perdita that was featured last season and there is a portrait of marie logan and these are of course not super detailed because they're very tiny pictures but i want everyone to cry about beast boys decorations too uh (laughs) And that is the scene where we hear the acoustic track a second time as he's leaving the page for the memorial open and replaying that song. Yeah, you know, because we just needed to break everyone, and especially me, even more. I was like, wow, Beast Boy's just lying in bed being sad. What's on his phone? Oh, oh okay. I'll just, I'll just process that that exists. Okay, this is fine. And speaking of, we end with the uh, the credit scene where, because this show goes from being like, okay, we're going to go to Santa Prisca and we're going to save Orphan and we're going to have a plan and this is going to be awesome. And then just cuts to Craig, the best little genome ever. Uh, just watch either. I don't think he's actually technically watching the Superboy fan memorial, even though it's the same music because the picture on the table is different. 
Yeah. But he's attending some sort of memorial thing and just he's mourning Connor and I'm not okay. For people who don't remember, Craig is the littlest genome that we see in season three who's buddies with Connor and which the tie-in comics explain was like the little genome that like taught Connor like the best things about the world and like loved and missed him after he left Cadmus and like tried to follow him to the cave and a bunch of other stuff. Craig is good. And I (laughs) did not know this show was going to punch me in the heart with him again. Yes. So there, there is a lot of information that can be gleaned from a lot of the features of when you're watching the show. Uh, and one I will point out at this time is that if you turn on the closed captioning, that is where I learned that they also kept using Lawrence as the reference name for Crusher Croc because his name is Lawrence Crusher Croc, but everyone calls him Crusher. But the, the uh, um, closed captioning calls him Lawrence, which I just it just seemed so ridiculous and funny to me. But that's also where you pointed out to me that the closed captioning says, right as the credits end, Craig sadly chirping. Yep. Yeah, I knew that. I already knew that that's what he was doing, but reading it, this is something <laughs> right? different. Well, this is something different. Right? Because when I, because I, I don't, the first time I watch through, I don't watch with the closed captioning on, but when I'm taking notes later, I do, just to make sure there's nothing I don't, that I I catch everything or that I make sure I'm understanding what's being said. And that I'm just finishing up typing something and I glance over and it's just like, Greg chirps sadly. I'm like, no, no, you can't do that. I know that's what you're doing, but somehow it hurts more. (laughs) Please share something fun, Neil. So something super interesting is that, I mean, we already pointed out like, okay, we've jumped a month ahead. So if McGann is on her way back with baby, then, you know, we're already halfway there. Um, but the one thing that really stood out to me in the very beginning was the was Artemis saying the one person I thought beyond my help and Paula's immediate response was Wally. <laughs> and that just yeah. that sent me for a continued loop. I'm just like, wait, OK, I don't have time. I don't have time to write notes on that, but I'm just going to throw that out there is like just so st- like stood out. Yep. Uh, Paul, Paul is holding out hope uh, along Paul with the rest of us. Yeah. Paul. Yep. Oh. Paul has got a, a string, red string conspiracy theory board tucked mm-hmm. away somewhere. Yep. Um, so we have, we have a lot of people that start to get introduced. So Onyx is officially here. Uh, you know, we, we had scenes from the trailer and things like that, but reveals herself to truly be Onyx. And, you know, the, again, that's one of the ones where we can do a deeper dive. And, recruit recruited to go after killer croc i think that was the other thing is like there's, there were all these like pseudo bat bat references like in other just like casual name drops that just continue to expand yeah. out like all of these things um also the scene where it's like you did handcuff two people that was just okay what did why why did you handcuff them what a waste of handcuffs but okay sure <laughs> yeah um, also crispin fighting crispin will always be some of my favorite. I mean, so it just adds into con- continuing my favorite scene um, of all time. Chris been arguing with himself uh, is just an impressive voice acting feat every time. But the ultimate battle happens when we pull up and you can see across the street from each other, a big belly burger and a 24 hour chicken whizzies. So <laughs> the ultimate battle in young justice, the feud of all time. But but really, how do they each stack up to a League of Shadows noodle truck? True. Which I, I thought was very funny. It was apparently fully equipped with noodles. Thank you. Thank you. That is exactly what I was going to say. What <laughs> seemed, did they steal it? And like that was true property damage? Or was it like a legitimate front and like they own it and they, they use it to like stake places out? Because not going to lie, that's a pretty solid idea because you could just drive. Okay. The pin is mightier than the sword. I already talked about that. But but yeah, so we get the casual drop that Clue Master is Spoiler's father, which that's, that's true in the comics and remains true here. And that she's already dealt with it off screen. Yeah. Done. <laughs> Handled. We also get the introduction of a new... Was she on the... Was she a team member? Was she a I think member? she's one of the outsiders because I think okay. she's in some of the photos that Beast Boy looks through in a previous episode. Yeah, because I, I didn't think because I don't 
Yeah, because I don't think she got recognized um, because she was already there interrogating. But we get the looker um, who is trying to figure out more with Cassandra and Onyx. So do we not want – I mean you didn't really bring it up. But do we not want to talk about how Jason Bard's single line caused um, quite the rabbit hole spiral in the Discord? And the whole time I was thinking, I don't know if any of this is true. This is amazing to watch unfold before my eyes. I'm going to put that in crashing the mode. Okay. We could talk a little bit about it, but we'll avoid the most rabbit hole parts of that conversation. <laughs> ah! <laughs> I can't bring anything up at 10 p.m. on the Discord. Okay, so one of the most interesting things about the introduction of Jason Bard is several several aspects. One is that this is technically the third episode in which we have seen him last, you know, 405, 406, and kicking it all the way back to one of the people in Failsafe. Hmm? And also one of the one of the really cool things I saw on Twitter was that. Again, that representation of you have someone who has been injured, they've lost their leg, and you see a superhero choose to be with that person. That, you know, that there's nothing in the way of that relationship existing. You know, they're, you know, first off, we kick it off, they're just a normal, um, if you will, they're just a normal human. Um, They don't have powers, but then also that, you know, it's about who they are. And, you know, seeing them together was a good representation for some people, which I thought was amazing. Me and Samwise uh, talked about uh, that whole concept. This was before Jason Bard had been introduced, of course, but if anyone wants to hear more about that and hear more perspectives about that kind of concept in superhero media, check out uh, my discussion with Samwise Gamgee a couple episodes back. They had some very interesting thoughts, and I highly recommend it. Um, So this isn't that, I mean, this is kind of sad, but I just assume it's the same park where they go to be sad about things. Um, So it was nice to see a happy (laughs) scene. There's one park. park. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's just the park where they go to be sad. So it was nice. (laughs) We'd have to check some timestamps, but. Yeah, uh, to be happy. Um, Also, Batman definitely knew who Orphan's mother was. And then I just wrote typical Bat Dad, just not telling anybody about anything. And you know that this universe's version of Batman, if asked, why didn't you tell anybody this about uh, Orphan, would just be like, I didn't feel it was relevant. She's who she is. Mm -hmm. And we're accepting her as she is because that's Batman's whole MO in Young Justice of like, I don't tell anybody's secrets until it's a problem. And in the infinite conservation of DC characters, we have the introduction of Rictus, which as far as I can tell, is in six issues of a run of uh, Red Hood uh, in like 2013. That's it. And just you that know, sounds about right. Character that perpetually replaces uh, body parts with cybernetics. Um, that's it. That's, uh, that, that's what I got. Oh nope, I will leave you on this very fun note. Um, so the her little Artemis, her sling is a tiger print. It makes me laugh yeah. every time. I, I liked thought it. that was cute too. I thought it was cute. We could make this. A boring arm sling, or no. we could foreshadow aesthetics. Definitely. And with that, though, we need to crash some mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. In Crashing the Mode, we will be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of recording. So this Crashing the Mode is based on episodes one through six and the trailer. So... I my first thing is there is a line in this episode and now I'm forgetting who says Tara says it when asked who they should trust Tara has this whole thing where she's like oh but Cassandra Savage is so loyal to her dad and blah 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 she would never betray him and she ends that by saying in that world she'd be quite the scandal and I was recently re-listening and listening to some of our previous discussion sessions uh, that I had just kind of that had flown under the radar for me because I'd been busy. And I was like, I should go back and listen to those. And in one of those, one of our guests, I think it's Greg Bashanke, mentions that in the comics, Vandal Savage has a daughter named Scandal Savage, who does in fact betray him to join the heroes. So question mark i don't i mean i have to 
deal with the fact that Vandal Savage named a kid Scandal Savage for a second. Um, outside of that, I mean. Again, this is just going off this discussion session, so my exact details might be a little off. That may just be her her code name or no, whatever. No, but-, but Vandal Savage had a daughter named Scandal. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> in some comics. And I just want to throw that out there. We'll see how that goes. We'll see what happens. So, a thing. Mm-hmm. There is a line in this episode <laughs> where Jason Bard, when asked how him and Artemis ended up together, says, my ex fixed us up when she dumped me for her ex, and I moved to Star City from Gotham to get my degree. And I could have done some Googling, but instead I reached out to our Patreon Discord to ask how people were interpreting this line. And I got a flood of people informing me that apparently in the comics, Jason Bard at one point dated Barbara Gordon, who could be the ex that set him up with Artemis when she broke up with him to go date Nightwing. And while that makes perfect sense, it's also for some reason very funny to me. Just the context of all of these characters, that just seems like a very funny turn of events. Yes. And in your spiral just continued so far because it's like, oh, he looked over. Does that mean he's referring to Artemis's ex when he says her ex? And then okay. there yeah. was tinfoil because hats passed around and it just went sideways. Because I will admit that my first interpretation of this line when I heard it, because the voice acting and the animation makes it look like when he says her ex, he looks over at Artemis, mm-hmm. which made me go, Jason Bard was dating somebody who dumped him to date Will, but that also doesn't make any sense because Will's not really Artemis's ex. That doesn't, we don't, we don't count that one misadventure. Uh, <laughs> but like, it was one of those things where that was just how my brain immediately interpreted a line. And then later I like paused for five seconds and was like, that doesn't line up with any information we've been given. Why is that what your brain jumped to? But also the fact that he specifically mentions that he moved from Gotham also kind of reinforces that it would make sense if Barbara Gordon turns out to be his ex. But we'll just have to wait and see. I don't know why I think this would be so funny. I just feel like this dynamic of these characters, what little we've seen of Jason Bard, just it feel it feels like it would just be a bundle of chaos to have Barbara just be like, hey, Artemis, here's my ex. Here's my ex-boyfriend. <laughs> you want him? Yeah, yeah. Try this out. He's a great guy. Oh, so I'm very interested in the next one because I very much. So speaking of Ariel, um, she pointed out that in on a re-listen, like you can definitively hear the difference between someone being named Cassandra and someone being named Cassandra. Yes. And for those who have no idea what we're talking about, this episode contains both Cassandra Savage and Cassandra Kane. And uh, when the shadows are on their way to go attack the vault, Lady Shiva says, be sure to get Cassandra safe. Uh, And I, like many people, just kind of brushed over that the first watch through because I'm like, yeah, Cassandra Savage. And then you listen to it again and pause for five seconds and go, that's not how you say her name. So I think you said your theory is that they were always coming to get orphan. Yeah. Well, yeah. And then the other thing is, well, the other thing is from the trailer, because in the trailer, we clearly see a mother daughter battle at some point for some reason, because that, because no one really recognized who it was with, when, you know, when the trailer first dropped, who's this person with all these scars that's fighting yeah. Lady Shiva. And so then, I mean, that's, we're leading that direction, obviously. They're much closer than they were up until this point. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what it'll be. Is it that there will be some circumstance of which I do not know that they will need to fight? <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out and I don't have any answers. So take that. That sounds about right. Okay. So rewatch, rewatching this episode for the second time, because every time I rewatch these episodes, I catch new things. Mm-hmm. Wonderful the way Young Justice does that. And I noticed, and someone can tell me if I'm wrong, because I did not go back and meticulously check my sound cues for this one. But it sounds like Rictus's armor makes the same sound as Father Box tech. And I have no idea what that means, but I noticed it and I wanted to share because it scares me. 
my thought was the color is kind of where my head was going. Like, is it the right color to be that sort of thing? Because then follow up is as much as clearly both sides of, you know, the, the good and evil equation, if you will, just to, just to give us a reference point, clearly know about each other. Is it that with, you know, kind of the origin of Rictus being replacing body parts with uh, technology after seeing Cyborg going down the road of like, hey, maybe I should test out some father box stuff. It seemed to work for this kid. Uh, maybe it could work for me. So um, I very much think that there are some father box stuff going on. So last thing from me before we wrap up this crashing the mode is so there is a 95% chance that Artemis and Cheshire uh, met up in that gap between Cheshire leaving the vault and everybody on the super cycle, right? We all agree on that? Like Cheshire's got to show up. I mean, come on. Of course. Yeah. But we got we got her saying the code word again that Artemis mm-hmm. clearly knows. And we also got her, the thing I'm still thinking about that I've been thinking about since the episode premiered, is that moment where Shade shows up and Cheshire Ooh, yeah. looks surprised or disappointed or offended or some combination of emotions because Shade is the one that she helped break out and free from the whole thing last season. Uh, so I personally think that she might call on a favor from him to help out and that's how she'll show up even though she's not on the super cycle or something like that we'll see well i'm not sure in that same moment again those, those very subtle things with that are that are done with such intention um is that like when you cut back shade clearly breaks eye contact um and looks away as they as they all disappear i didn't notice that but that's a very good catch my other thing with this, speaking of the Cheshire using the code word thing with Artemis, me and Ariel were talking because <laughs> this is what happens. Not to sound like a broken record, but we were talking about this and both of us think if we continue down this path of the way they've been doing Artemis and Jade flashbacks into the next episode or two of this arc, that there is a high likelihood that we will see that scene on the rooftop from when Artemis was little from Jade's perspective, because both of us aren't convinced that Jade chose not to show up. You know what I mean? Like that something got in the way of her showing up because nothing about little Jade says to me that she would like promise. Yeah, I'll make sure that you're fine and then not follow through on it. I think both of us are a little convinced that sports master might've caught her and stopped her. And then found Artemis on the rooftop, because why would Sportsmaster know what rooftop to look on? These are questions. But we'll find out. We'll see. We will. So, I think that's that's enough of that. Unless you have more mode to crash. Nope, I have crashed. So... With all that, I think we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us here today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at TheYJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that isn't enough for you, you can also email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support our show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. because those are much harder to find. If you are able to support us monetarily and wish to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. 
Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.